Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us at tonight's very special event. My name is Rowan Conway. I'm director of the Connected Communities Research Programme at the RSA, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's special event, the 150th um, Albert Medal Award, which is the 214th Albert Medal Presentation and Lecture. The RSA has been awarding the Albert Medal for Innovation in the fields of creativity and social improvement since 1864. Historic winners have included Faraday, Edison, Lister, Marconi and um, Marie Curie. In more recent years, this award has gone to um, Sir Tim Smith, co-founder of the Eden Project, um, Zareen Karas, a social entrepreneur, and the community artist Jeremy Della as well as the environmental active, activist Albina Ruiz. The Albert Medal has evolved over the years uh, to the point that it's now recognised as a means of identifying and rewarding those at the forefront of practical social innovation. And you can certainly say that is the case for Joste Bloch. Um, it, 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 it champions unsung heroes who are driven by a desire to make the world a better place. And the Bertzorg model that you're going to hear about really shows that model in action. Jos is the founder and CEO of Bertzorg, which is a transformational model of community care focused on building meaningful and trusting relationships between nurses, patients and neighbourhoods. So it's, a, it's genuinely active in the community. Along with a small group of colleagues and inspired by new ways of working and valuing people, importantly this is a, a social enterprise rather than a commercial enterprise, Jos has grown the network from just four to now over 8,000 nurses working his way through the Netherlands and internationally. He has a very interesting and chequered career, starting out as an economist, becoming a nurse, and then now as a chief executive going around the world to share the Bertzog model. We're delighted to have um, Jos here today, and it's my great pleasure to invite Don Pinche Pinchbeck to... We, we had the stairs here, they moved over there, so it just threw everything out a bit. Um, to Don, to on behalf of our Board of Trustees, to present the medal to Joost Block. Please like, join me. It gives me great pleasure to present you with the Albert Medal for your achievements, and we're really looking forward to hearing uh, about all that, you, that you've achieved. But, Maybe the greatest uh, present I can give you is Life Fellowship of the Royal Society of Arts. And there is the moment. I'm very honoured. Um, first, I got a letter from the RSA. I thought it was a joke for one of my sons. Um, but then, I got to learn more about the RSA and I feel very honored to be in this long list of very, um, for me, very interesting and important people. So, yeah. thank you very much. Joe, I'd like to invite you now to thank the you. Of your <laughs> So, yes, thank you very much for coming to listen to me. Um, I want to tell you something about um, this uh, journey I made for the last eight years, uh, together with my wife, Ronny. Uh, we started a new company. Um, but, and it was not just starting a company. For me, it was, um, as a community nurse, I wanted to start a movement which would make the healthcare and elderly care in Holland better. Because um, as being a community nurse, after my study economics. Um, I think this is the most beautiful profession you can have, uh, but it was disturbed in many ways, I will tell you. So that was the reason that I said we have a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of bureaucracy which is disturbing good solutions. So that's the reason that I called it uh, humanity above bureaucracy. If you look at uh, what Buurtzorg is at the moment, we can say it's a new organizational and a new delivery model. Um, my ideas about organizing are quite different than what I learned at the MBA study. I didn't finish. No, that's, I didn't finish a lot of studies. Um, but I learned a lot from it. 
I started in uh, 2007 with uh, four nurses, uh, with uh, three colleagues, uh, just in one team, um, uh, trying to go back to the principles of the World Health Organization on community-based integrated care, which I think is a very good model. Um, at the moment, we have 9,000 nurses in, 8, in 800 independent teams working all over the country. And um, what's very special is that we have uh, only 45 uh, staff people in the head office. Uh, and we have 15 coaches. So we don't have management. So it's just the teams and me, which is not really needed. Um, because I'm traveling a lot in a lot of countries at the moment. And we are serving 70,000 patients a year. I'll tell more about what type of patients later on. Uh, then we have a turnover of 280 million euro per year. And we have just six people at the financial administration. And we don't have a CFO. So if you keep things very simple, um, then you don't need so many people to control all these things. So in these uh, few years of studies of economics helps that I can do it in two hours a week. So I don't hope I uh, have offend, offended some CFOs at the moment. Um, one of the m most important reasons um, that I started with, with Bootsov was because of the uh, increasing bureaucracy. Um, in the 19s in Holland, healthcare and especially community-based care uh, was defined as production. Before that, we worked as community nurses just trying to solve problems. And then at a certain moment, it was production. And we developed 10 different products, which was called personal care, personal care extra, personal care special. And we had nursing, nursing care special, nursing care extra, guidance, <laughs> guidance extra. And really, it still is... Um, for a lot of commissioners in Holland, it's the way they, they buy care. We want to buy so many hours of this and so many hours of that. And it's really disturbing the relationship with, with patients, between patients and nurses. And it led to a lot of fragmentation between cure, care and prevention. The assumption was when we uh, create these incentives, these market incentives, and we call it products, that the quality would rise and the uh, costs would uh, go down, but the opposite happened. So the costs went right up, so we are the second country in the world with the most expex uh, expensive healthcare uh, system, and the, the quality went, went down. A lot of nurses quit their jobs because they lost their autonomy, they have to follow all these regulation protocols and so on, and they've lost also their craftsmanship. What I liked a lot about community nursing is that in every situation you can um, find in some kind of a co-production with the patient what's the best solutions in this, in, in this situation. And that got lost because of all the different products and, and protocols. And we got, um, when we look at the de demographics, and, and I think it's the same in Great Britain, when we face the coming 20, 20 years, we got a lot of problems with getting enough young people uh, in healthcare. So we, have, we uh, should make it more, more inspirational for young people. Clients, uh, because of these many products, clients were, were confronted with a lot of uh, different care caregivers. So there was one in Amsterdam and he put all the names on, the, on the, uh, one of the doors in his room. And in, during one year he got 150 different um, caregivers and nurses coming at, her, at his house. And there has been research that when you are regularly more, you get more than seven people at your house, you lose control. So, and I think one of the most important things is that we empower people and give control to people. And then we spend billions of euros, billions of pounds on, on uh, elderly care. And we, we didn't have any information about if, these, uh, if this money helps solve problem, problems. So what we, what we only knew was how many hours care we were giving, but not if it was solving problems. So, so that were a lot of reasons to start this new organization. Uh, and the ideas were quite simple, because I worked in the 80s myself this way. 
uh, with a small team of, of eight nurses being responsible for all these people in this village and everyone had his own neighborhood. So I took the same principles and it was for me the most happy time that I didn't had any kind of management. So we were just dealing with all kinds of problems ourselves. So the idea was independent teams with a maximum of 12 nurses working in a neighborhood for five to 10,000 inhabitants and just organize everything themselves. So not thinking about all these different codes and products, but just thinking about what are the <coughs> best solutions for the patients we are meeting and doing the assessment themselves, the, the planning, the scheduling and so on. And sharing a lot of experience with each other together. The ideas are based on, on principles of self-organization. Um, we say that it can only work when you trust these nurses and there is no reason not to trust them. Every nurse became a nurse to become a good nurse. So the idea is let's just um, focus on, on this trust and let's reduce the complexity and we also started an IT company at the same time because a lot of software is only developed for the administrative processes in the organization. So we said we want to support the nurses in every way also by using the most smart IT and, and software. And they're all working with iPads and all doing things digital and also doing a lot of innovations at the same time. Um, the, the idea of maximum of 12 nurses is that you can coordinate everything together and you don't need some kind of a leader in a team. So they're all equal, they're all deciding on based on consensus and uh, all, everyone is taking his, his, his or her responsibility in doing the best possible things. Um, they are generalists, they have to be able to take care for all types of pa patients because uh, they deliver 24 hours a day care. So they organize it, they are available 24 hours a day. We don't have a call center. So they just get all the phone calls themselves and they solve all the things themselves. 50% uh, are bachelor educated nurses. They have their own education budget because they know the best what kind of education they need. It's very context driven. So when you have more problems with, uh, for example, uh, um, palliative terminal care, then you, you know that you have to have this expertise in the team and you have more uh, education on that. The idea is also that informal networks are much, more, much stronger than organizational structures. So all these nurses have their networks and have a lot of influence in their environment. So when, uh, in my role before I started with Buso, I was a director and I noticed that a lot of things which I think were important, were, and you think at that moment you were managing these things, didn't happen. And now they happen very easily just because all these nurses have their networks in their neighborhoods they are working. Um, this is one of the teams, they seem quite happy. Um, and this is one of our patients, and at the moment she's 103. So she's living in Rotterdam. There are the different types of patients, uh, patients who are chronically ill, uh, patients with multiple pat pathology. Uh, we have a lot of complex patients because the GPs in Holland say, if we send patients to your organization, then we know that things are going well. Um, we don't have these call centers and we don't have a lot of coordination with uh, these patients. They SMS each other, text each other in the evening when this terminal ill patients uh, need some extra pain management. They just say it, uh, it's very simple things, but very important. Uh, we have a lot of people with dementia, uh, and we have a lot of people who come from hospital and are not fully recovered yet. This is our vision model. We say we should be part of the community. So every nurse should have her network with volunteers, with the GPs, with the social workers, so informal networks and formal networks and try to make virtual teams around the patient. So, and every time that's be, uh, because of uh, the, the different problems of the patients that's changing. So you have different contacts. An average team has around 25 to 30 relationships in the neighborhood and they're using it to find solutions and to make themselves not needed anymore. 
So in this old paradigm, um, they were delivering production, and we got paid for the hours. So what you saw, there's a lot of organizations were delivering more and more hours. So we say, no, we go back to the professional ethics, and we say the, the, the way you learn your profession is that you have to help people in a way that they can help themselves again. So we focus on self-management. We also try to f use um, new IT uh, possibilities with it. It's network uh, creating uh, and, um, and empowering. And uh, we'll show some uh, examples afterwards. Then about quality. Um, in Holland, we had a lot of uh, discussion about this uh, quality, were, which were based on in industrialized ISO systems. And you say, okay, that's, that's not fit for what, what we uh, need. So what we do is we monitor the outcome based on uh, the Omaha system. So we measure what the uh, effectiveness is of our interventions. So we say we, if we want to learn uh, patients how to deal with their problems, we want to sh show what the effect is. And we want also show that they need less care when we do it well. So and we did some researches already um, last few years and showed that the amount of hours can be reduced when you do the right things. So that's, uh, I, I think, a big, a big advantage of working this way. Um, of course, the high education level is a, is a very important thing. Um, the, in, in Holland, the, the average home care organization has around 10% of uh, registered nurses and we have 70% of registered nurses. So that's, and if you don't have so much overhead, you can use the money for the nurses. Uh, we also started with the Busog Academy. It's an uh, e-learning environment in which all the nurses can use for um, get educated on different uh, fields. And of course, we, every year we measure in different ways the satisfaction of the clients. Uh, then the uh, su supporting the independent teams. Uh, of course, we want to avoid that they have this bureaucracy so, and they get paid their salaries. So that's what we do in the head office. We have 45 people uh, and 50 coaches and we have no, manage, no managers at all. I, perhaps my wife is the only manager because she tells me every morning at six o'clock what I forgot and what I should do the next day. But that's the same, I think, with every man here in this room. Um, but uh, we didn't have one management meeting since we started. So a lot of meetings, my, my former job were only about meetings from one meeting to another. And I think and, uh, now we just have time to solve the problems. So we don't have meetings. And I, I can add everyone advice to be very critical about what kind of meeting you are doing is really uh, useful. So I think the, the me because in a lot of organizations in Holland, the meetings for the nurses were skipped because they were not productive. But they were the most useful meetings because they have to exchange their ideas and their experience. So that's what we do quite differently. So, and, and then, of course, they are doing all the necessary things um, which, which is, uh, needs to be happen at, at the head office. But only 45 people is, I think, 10% uh, of what the most organizations have with 9,000 employees. Then we build an IT system which uh, supports the nurses in, in a, a, a good way. And the next step is also to involve uh, the patients to be active in this platform. So um, we want to show what we are doing. Uh, we want to exchange information between do doctors, nurses, and hospitals. And we want to involve the patients. And it's all part of the same strategy, which we started in 2005. And we also developed it together with, with friends. And I think that's one of the uh, very important things which happened when we started to discuss this in 2005. We were with four or five friends together who want to do these things all together with all different kinds of expertise. And we're still working together and starting it to, the, to try to bring it to the next phase. 
Um, what was very nice to experience was that um, this, uh, this um, IT system also worked as some kind of a Facebook. So I, I write my blog. I don't write, write policy notes. I don't write strategic notes. So we don't have growth goals or something. We just invite everyone who wants to work this way is very welcome. So and a lot of people like that. But I share my, uh, my concerns and then in my blog and then I got a lot of response from the different teams. And when they, this response is going some direct direction, then we say, okay, let's make it a new policy. So that's how to develop policy in a modern way, I think. Um, the teams are working very um, solistic, so they're focusing on the neighborhood, but because of the, the uh, platform, they feel like, like one. They feel part of Bootsoch, but they don't um, feel Bootsoch as an organization who gives them trouble, but only as a network who gives them uh, presence. But yes, we like to, yes, one of the most important things is that we like to party and we like to give a lot of presence. That gives, gives a nice feeling. Um, and of course we have to do all the, nece uh, the necessary things for the um, accountability. Okay, this is, uh, this is hap that happened um, last uh, years. So we, from all the, the different places in Holland, these nurses di decided after 10, 20 years sometimes to resign the job and just to start. And what, what happened was very, um, I think very fundamental because n not one of them resigned before. So it was some kind of a movement that they decided and that empowered the nurses very much that they decided themselves to make this choice and to start to work in another way. This is another team. Um, of course, when we started, a lot of organizations said um, all this pressure on these nurses that they have to decide on everything themselves, that's going back to the Middle Ages. That's what they said. So we decided to do some research on that, uh, on the satisfaction of the nurses. And what they said is that, that they appreciate this working in small teams very much. And um, what was not our first goal, but was one of the outcome is that we became the best employer of the year in 2011, 12, and 14. 2013, we came second after KLM at 100. But we, we uh, no. <laughs> Uh, this is in the north of Holland, Harlingen. Always very welcome when you'll be there. Uh, and of course, it's very important what clients thought about it. So we uh, do uh, reviews with every client when uh, the care is ended. And we do one national review every year. And from the start, we have the highest client satisfaction of the country. And we also have the support and work very closely together with the client organizations and the elderly organizations because we, the most important feedback from them uh, we use in, in our quality uh, discussions. Then I'm going to show you some small part of uh, an, a very important innovation. It was in um, 2010 on a Saturday morning. I was reading the newspaper and on page seven of this new paper, newspaper was happening this. Ja, ik heb veel plezier en ik verklaar het nu dat het laatste man officieel open. En go! Come out, take care and see. Come out, take care and see. You will get me going on. You will get me going on. Kijk wat ik voel met begeel bij me. I will explain. Um, <laughs> it's in Dutch, but there was this patient, she was 84 in Amsterdam, and she said there are competitions for everyone, but not for us elderly uh, behind a, a walker. And then this nurse, Marjolein, she said, then we are going to organize this. So she went to the city hall and to the insurance uh, organization, health insurance, and she got 10,000 10, euro in 2010, and she organized this walker race uh, for the first time. In 2014, 
uh, in September, we have, for the first time we had a national walker race in the Olympic Stadium in Amsterdam. <laughs> and there were buses coming from all over Holland with people behind the walker. And you really, I was, uh, I, um, was, was the one who, who shot them, uh, not shot them, but uh, <laughs> I, I sta was the starter. Starting. Yeah, starting, thank you. Um, <laughs> and it was funny to see that th some of them were, were dr um, drove with, with a wheelchair to the, to the starting line and then were put behind uh, the walker race and did one, two or three rounds. They all got a medal and a certificate. And I think it's very symbolic for when we focus on what people can do and their abilities, they feel much better and they feel that there are still parts and they can do valuable things. So that's what the nurses try to do all the time, try to find things and they're not fit, they can't fit in protocols. So the diversity, we support the diversity in the teams, try to find good things which make people feel better even if they have a lot of disabilities. So, and I think that's, that's one of the most uh, beautiful examples uh, in the last few years, I think. Um, a lot of organizations are also taking it over, so they're also uh, doing these th kind of things now. Then, uh, if you look at the cost effectiveness for the organization, the overhead costs are quite low, uh, if you look at compared with other organizations. So you can use, them, use the money for higher skilled nurses and for innovation and education. So that's, we are a non-for-profit organization, we are a foundation, because uh, our values don't fit in a commercial organization. So, and that's, I think, uh, for me, very important in the discussion about so how should we create incentives to create better healthcare, and is competition leading to better healthcare? Then the sickness rate is, is lower, and uh, uh, people feel very happy to work this way, I think. Um, if you look at the home care costs in, in, in Holland, there would be 70% if everyone would work the same. At the moment, um, uh, the government is um, uh, taking a, our way of working as an example. And they, they say, okay, they started the program uh, five years ago that um, every organization get extra support when they are going to work this way. So, say so this should be a normal way to work. So, and from the beginning, we also uh, connected with a lot of politicians. So even with the, prime, the former prime minister, he came um, on the bicycle and went with uh, one of the nurses to some patients, which was quite funny because one of the patients who was a bit uh, dementing um, worked for the European, European Committee. And he said, oh, my dear Mr. President, I always saw your signature uh, beneath the documents, but only he was talking about the Prime Minister of 20 years ago. So it was Ruth Lubbers, never know. Um, but they're now stimulating other organizations and also other sectors are quite uh, interested in the um, model. So we, I also work with policemen and with teachers because I think it's a general model which can be used in different sectors. Uh, we also uh, develop new concepts based on the same principles. So we, uh, we have youth care now, psychiatric home care, domestic care, short stay rehabilitation, hospice care, and out, out the, uh, uh, occupational therapists and physiotherapists. And we started an organization in Sweden, Belgium, U United States, and a few weeks ago was with the king and queen of Holland in uh, Tokyo and we signed together a contract, or together, I signed it and they were looking. <laughs> but it was quite special. Um, so, and that the, the Japan, um, I've, I've been for four years in Japan now, and Japan is very interesting because of their, also their demographic situation and their um, um, more and more, or less and less, I should say, younger people uh, to um, use this model. Um, what was very important in all these countries is are the questions about uh, how to deal with all the cultural aspects. And what you see is that every nurse understands the nursing part. So, say, okay, that's the first focus. And then we discuss with all different uh, stakeholders how to deal with uh, safeguarding and other uh, uh, important things. And usually, 
um, the nurses have more creative ideas on how to deal with it than their managers. So you, I think it's very important to have this discussion with the professionals themselves and find solutions for how to deal with it. And sometimes it, it helps when you're not um, so obedient. So I think in, in the system, sometimes we are too obedient in um, are we following all the rules and the regulations. And I think sometimes you have to follow the patient instead of the rules and regulations. So that's my advice for every nurse in, in Holland who's working for Buitzog. Use your common sense instead of the rules and regulations. If you look at uh, discussions about leadership, uh, I think uh, the future will change that the one you see uh, there, that's Marianne, and she will be the leader of the future. So professionals more and more will be leaders of their own work and they will be still inspired by a lot of people in the other pictures but uh, I got a lot of questions about leadership and I think we should be careful with leadership's programs and not focusing it on management but focusing on professionals on how to be responsible for your own work. Um, last few years we uh, did some research uh, or one um, one, from one of the universities, someone did some research, it's called Shada Nandram. Um, she's from an Indian background. And she um, um, defined a new, um, a new theory. She said, what you're doing is not, doesn't fit in the current theories in how to organize. So she said there are three principles. Uh, the needing principle, um, do what's needed. The second is the rethinking principle. Just reflect on what you're doing and try to do it better if, you're not, if you think you're not doing the best you can. And the third principle is the common sensing principle. Use your common sense. Um, if you're interested, this book will be published the coming weeks. And uh, the title uh, is um, Organizational Innovation by Integrating Simplification. <laughs> so that's... It's really, that's the title. <laughs> um, so the, because when I was thinking about coming to this place and knowing it was um, the Royal Society for Arts, I think the art I know is the art of simplicity, I think. So it was something I can contribute. Um, so I think we need new parad paradigms to solve the problems we are meeting. We have a lot of problems at the same time at, at the moment. We, we had the financial crisis and I think it's not over yet. Um, but we also have eco ecological uh, problems and we have uh, problems with our energy. So my idea is that we have to find other ways to organize to uh, create more solutions. Um, a nice book which gives a lot of um, optimism is uh, the book of Frederic Laloux. Reinventing Organizations, who shows that organizations who decide uh, to skip the hierarchy in their organization have the best results. So I think that's good, worthwhile thinking. In Holland, I work together a lot with Jan Rotmans. He's a professor in transitions, and he says, we are at the moment, we are not in um, uh, an era of changes, but we are in a uh, change of eras. So every 150 years, uh, we need other ways of how to deal with, with problems. And he sees us as one of the examples who break through, uh, broke through the system. Uh, then uh, also working together with um, Mathieu Wegeman, he, said, he wrote a book, Leading Professionals Don't, because professionals can lead themselves. So a lot of organizational structures are just bothering professionals. And I wrote a book myself, and it's titled Humanity Above Bureaucracy. Um, then I come to some conclusions. Um, I was in Norway uh, some weeks ago, and there they said, um, we have a lot of problems because of the new public management. And uh, then I said, try to escape from the new public management, because then it gives a lot of more space, more ideas about how to deal with the things you are, have to deal with. 
um, I think we have to build organizations on meaningful relationships. So I think that, especially in healthcare, it is about trustful relationships. That is the best, I think, condition for good healthcare. Then we should think about, as an organization, what's the value for the community, uh, not what's the commercial value for the organization. I think organizations should be uh, financially healthy, but they should think about what their value is for the community. Uh, f uh, I think we, we should focus more on happiness and, and health. Uh, I think that um, when uh, nurses in our organization feel happy, they will uh, stay healthy and they will do good things. And last conclusion is let's avoid complexity. So we, we build very complex organizations and even if we are with 9,000 people, it can be a very simple organization. So uh, try to uh, focus on craftsmanship and on simple um, organizations. And then uh, the complexity is in the work itself. So we have to deal with very complex situations, but keep the organization simple and people can do their work as good as possible. And then for the future, we need young people um, to be attracted to healthcare, and I'm glad that my youngest son is becoming a nurse, so I contrib contributed to this <laughs> myself. Um, thank you. <laughs> and I will thank you all for your attention, and I hope uh, it was worthwhile to listen to. Thank you. Thank you, Jos, for um, an inspiring presentation. Um, we're going to take some questions, and I have some roving mics in the back, one roving mic at least. Um, I'll start with, I've got a couple of questions that I'm burning to ask, and then I'll take probably two at a time. Um, I, I love the confidence behind this model. It's extraordinary, and it's very simple, as you say. Um, launching it into, you're not launching these things into a blank sheet of paper, and so, when you say that there's, with great confidence, there's no reason not to trust nurses, I think a, a lot of people may come back with a raft of reasons why there might be. So, how do you encourage the political courage it takes to embrace this kind of model um, when bureaucracy is something, it's a crutch to lean on. Bureaucracy is about accountability, you know, you, you mentioned ISO mm -hmm. systems. So how do, you, how do you engender political courage in those leaders who need to adopt this kind of model? I um, started with uh, the nurses because I know that um, most of the community nurses I know, um, they, they feel like this. They feel very confident in what they are doing. Um, and they don't have um, a lot of status feeling. So what uh, they do uh, all the time is inviting uh, politicians uh, to come and see also the inspection, also people from the insurance companies that just see what we are doing. Um, and that's what we did from the start. So we saw it as a transition that you have to explain every time that nothing um, uh, very um, bad is happening. Uh, it's not um, very risky. Um, it's, in fact, it's, it's less risky than what we are doing in these hierarchical organizations because everyone is taking responsibility. And just by showing it uh, and doing research and building evidence, we showed that it's, a, in my opinion, much better model than we had. And you've, this system has grown very rapidly. So you moved from four till 8,000 or so. I mean, has the model sustained? Has it been stable in the delivery as it's grown over time? Yes, but what you see is that every team is, is a learning environment. So what you see is that when you visit a nurse uh, team um, and you visit it three years later, then you see that they are all on a higher level. So they created their networks and the first year they focus on other primary things and then the second and third year they focus on, oh, what can we do more? Uh, do we know different patient groups in our neighborhood which needs extra attention? So they, grew, they grow in their uh, 
maternity. No? Mm -hmm. yeah. And they, um, they feel more, more secure in what they're doing and more confident. So I think it's more and more uh, sustainable. When we, when we had 100 teams, um, we thought, what, what would happen if we have 500 teams? Would we have, have uh, five, more, five times more problems? But the opposite happened, because every time solutions are shared with each other. So this web, um, this, our Facebook works very well in sharing all the knowledge. And so a lot of teams get knowledge from other teams in how to deal with things. Mm -hmm. No, that, I mean, that's very interesting. I think it's, it's, a, it's a sort of hyper-local lens. People can understand their own local context and then apply it to their work. I mean, there is also the, the fact that you travel widely and you alluded to the fact that you were with the king and queen signing contracts in Tokyo. And with that, I mean, I, I think, do you often get the question, well, this may work in Holland, but it won't work here because of X, Y, Z? Is, how do you respond to that kind of... That depends. Um, uh, always when, when uh, nurses are um, coming to see us, then they say, okay, this is the most optimal way of working for nurses. Um, there are a lot of CEOs who think that this, this can't work in their country. Uh, so uh, I think you never should start with the CEOs then, with, with the nurses. So I had in Japan, for, for example, for four years, I had a lot of meetings with, with nurses and doctors. And they uh, discussed it in their organizations. And now there are 30 experiments in Japan who are inspired by the way of working. And the next step will be that um, we find a way to make a Japanese translation of this model. So that's what we are going to do the next month. So every time, I think, uh, the, the basic principles, principles of, of primary health care, I think, are fit for every country. And how to organize it uh, should be um, part of the discussion in the different countries, I think. Okay, sounds interesting. OK, I'm going to hand it out to the floor. I have a question in the back there and a question here. So if I take the first two, and then I'll come back to another two. So, gentleman in the corner. Um, Harpreet Sue from NHS England. Obviously, thank you for coming in a wonderful model. Um, the UK, well, England as well, is a, we have a very robust primary care setup and we do have the substrate to provide something like this. Firstly, have you considered the UK as an area to explore this? If so, what do you envisage the challenges to be? If not, then why not? Have you not considered the UK? Oh, yes. Uh, I've been in uh, the UK uh, several times last few years on different uh, conferences and uh, di different lectures. And we get a lot of visitors from the UK. <coughs> so different groups, for also from uh, London. Um, and some of them would like to do an experiment in, uh, in London. But I always wait uh, till the time is uh, there. So I think the motivation should be, not my motivation, but should be the motivation of the NHS, of people here in, in, uh, in England. Um, so I think the time will come. Uh, in the coming years, I think there will be some experiments uh, and we will support it when we are asked to. But I, n I never, I don't want to export myself. I just want to support uh, countries who ask for support. So, so I think the, um, I, I know the discussions in the NHS uh, at the moment and I think um, it's, it's, uh, some of the, the discussions can lead to the wrong uh, solutions. So I would advise the NHS to do some experiments and to make some kind of a transition program which, they, which make clear what kind of solutions you have and then choose the best one. <laughs> so, okay. <clears throat> yes, thanks very much for a very fascinating presentation. Uh, two quick questions, one on finance. Um, who pays? Is it the state, the insurance companies, or the patients? And on the same uh, uh, issue, uh, are the charges differences between the teams? No. Um, first question, the, the, uh, at the moment, to 2014 is still um, the government uh, pays, so it's, it's a collective insurance. Um, in 2015, 
uh, the community care is paid by the health insurance. Tell us a bit more about the, how you do you select the patients? Or do you reject some patients? <laughs> and then you did mention that there was a shorter period of care, and you said there were quite a lot of your patients were terminal. Does that mean? <laughs> does that mean they are? Sorry, it's a journalist asking it. A, a stupid question, no, I, but uh, does that mean they're dying quicker with you than they would have done otherwise? Yeah. No, the first years, um, there were all kind of um, uh, uh, responses like, like cherry picking and so on. Uh, there are now uh, places where we do 80 to 90 percent of all the patients, so there is no um, possibility of... <laughs> but what we see is that, um, and I think that will be the same in, in, in England, that the GPs um, try to find places where um, people are, are secure. And because of the education level, uh, we got a more complex situation. So the average, if you look at the um, average organization, we have more complex care. So, but we don't, we don't select. It's not a policy. We say we focus on the community and we should be able to deal with all kinds of patients. Oh, suddenly there's millions of questions. Right, I'm going to have to remember all this. Thank you. It was fascinating. In the countries that have adopted your model and that have um, systems similar to yours, um, sort of going back to some of these other questions, are they private um, companies that have embraced your model, or are you? And does it depend upon the culture of the country as to whether it's uh, a nationalized um, sort of social service system? Um, I'm just curious whether you're finding that private companies are more likely to embrace your model because of the cost saving, the client satisfaction, that type of thing, and there's less bureaucracy in a profit-based uh, organization. Yes, um, it's, I think it's an uh, important um, uh, issue because we say that it, it doesn't uh, work in an organization where the profit is the most important focus. I think it can work in a profit organization when you um, take um, when you don't want too much margin. Um, we started an organization in, in the United States and, and Sweden ourselves to show how it works. And they are both also non for profit organizations. So the idea is to put an example and then we expect that other uh, organizations adopt the model. In Japan, it's different. So in Japan, uh, different organizations started a new foundation, and this foundation is supporting different organizations who want to work with the model. So that's uh, so we we try to find out what kind of um, strategies works. Okay. Uh, we have a question up here, and then we'll go to the middle after that, and then. Then we will get to you. <laughs> um, thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. I'm Brendan Martin of Public World, and we're developing, we're trying to develop with the UK Home Care Association and local government information unit and others uh, an approach to home care in Britain, which is dominated by a time and task model, such as the antiquated um, approach you described having replaced. But it's evident from your talk that an important part or an important element of the success of Board Talk has been the, uh, the fact that you have a higher level of qualification of the, of the nurses themselves. Whereas in, here in Britain, in general, home care workers are, are not uh, trained to the same level of, 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 of qualification. What do you think um, is the implications of that? for trying to transform home care in, in, in such an environment? Yes, I, I think that um, if you combine uh, nursing care, social care, prevention and cure, then you need these um, education levels. Um, and if you are working with too low educated care workers, um, I think you won't have these results. It's, uh, what I said is it's um, in the 80s, after your um, 
study in, in, in becoming a nurse in a hospital, you had to do two years of education to become a district nurse. So it was in nursing, it was the highest level. And it was because it's quite complicated to work in a network where you have to deal with all these different um, people in the network, with these different interests, and focus on self-support. So, um, so I think one of the conditions is that you really have to work with uh, good educated nurses. And it's better to do a small experiment to show that, that it works, and then um, discuss the impact. But in, in Holland at the moment, because of the policy changes, um, there is a big shortage now on uh, level five nurses, we call it, bachelor nurses. And uh, three, four years ago, uh, there was, <laughs> it was the opposite. Uh, everyone thought that uh, high-skilled nurses were too expensive. So if you see it uh, in the long term, then uh, every country has to find out what kind of strategy leads to the right uh, education level. But I think, um, I think to, if, you, if you think you can do it also with lower educated care, care workers, you won't have, have the same impact. Um, we have, someone has a mic already, okay. Hi, Jos. Mm. Uh, very good talk, thank you. Um, you mentioned values a few times in your talk, and I was very interested to know <coughs> what they actually were. Forgive me, I haven't read your book, but I suspect they might be in there. But what your values actually are, how you came up with them and how they are applied to create this kind of network that works? I think the most um, important uh, value is um, based on, on your uh, professional ethics. So what we say is um, you're not um, doing this for um, creating profit. You're, you're you're, you, I was, I was uh, standing before the statue of um, uh, Florence Nightingale this afternoon. <laughs> Your, um, yeah, she was born in 1870 and died in 1910, only 40 years old. But she had, in her 40 years, she had, a, 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 I think, a very big message in how to deal with inequality in, in all kinds of circumstances. Um, so the focus is uh, the value, uh, your values as a nurse uh, and how to deal with, with patient problems, I think is the most important value. Then um, the, the, one of the other values is taking care for each other. So in, in the teams, you need to be concerned about each other. You're, you're uh, depending on each other in how a team works. Um, so that's a very important value. And then... Uh, another value is about um, how, to, how to decide in the organization as a whole. So um, what we say is the consensus is a very important value. So that's, and, and they're not so very explicit. We don't talk so much about these values. They're just everyone who's working with Bussig understands them because they're very logic. Okay. So it's gentleman there, and um, I'm going to come to the gentleman there because he's had his hand up forever. So we'll start with you, and then there, and then we'll have one more question. But don't fear, we actually have um, drinks downstairs in the Benjamin Frank Franklin room, so you can continue this conversation afterwards. Jos, Jos will be joining us for a bit. But thank you very much. Um, I work in education, and uh, I just wanted to ask a bit more about simplicity and complexity. Uh, I mean, when I started out, things were fairly simple student, teacher, boss, and then all sorts of very good intentions to improve professional development, care of special needs, improving human resources, introducing IT, all led to a new complex part of the organization. So the complexity grew out of what seemed to be very good, worthwhile intentions. So how do we sort of get back to simplicity? And presumably those sort of aspects are carried out in your teams. They're thinking about their own human development and how to deal with special needs and all these other things. But presumably they're doing it in the team, are they, rather than having growing a new piece of the bureaucracy? Um, 
Yeah, I, I think that when I was um, in my former job, I was director of innovations. And I learned about uh, the self-referential uh, self effect uh, from Habermas. I said uh, a lot of people who are not dealing with the primary process, they think that they are the ones who uh, are important for the organization. And they think all kinds of things which um, leads to all kinds of complexity. So my idea is you shouldn't have these people. So if you don't, if you don't have these people, you don't have this problem. <laughs> so, and that's, I think, uh, it sounds very simple, but it's very difficult. When you have them, you don't get rid of them anymore. So, so be careful. With, uh, but I think it's part of what I said, um, the, the, the new public management, uh, the way we organize in... <coughs> When I did the MBA, I had the idea that uh, thinking in HR, ICT, finance, and so on, it's, it's a very good structure. I think, oh, now I know how it works. <laughs> but then I thought, it's bringing us a lot of problems if we think this way. So I, I should think we need an alternative for all kind of MBA kind of uh, education. And I, I think uh, if we go back to the teachers, I, I was in Finland, and in Finland they have, I think, one of the best uh, school systems um, and of education systems, and there they start with the teachers. So the teachers are very uh, responsible as in teams, working in teams, and what we found out is they're working almost the same way as our teams are working. So it's based on the same principles. So just go back to the professionals and then ask what they need to be organized and then you will discover that that's not so difficult. And then think about what to do with the rest. The gentleman. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, you may think I'd be slightly biased. I work for the Royal College of Nursing. Um, so it's great that you're, you know, you're in a long line of nurses who set up great social enterprises and deliver care in the way that people really want to. Um, I'm intrigued by your, the, the way you talked about the education, so the nurses that are able to buy their own training, because for many nurses in the UK, actually having the time to go on training is, is not there, never mind resources that they can command themselves. But you made it seem rather that they go off and do it as they want to. Is there any guidance you provide or are there any sort of strictures about how that's, how that's done across the team so that everyone gets you know, a fair share or that, you've, that people are getting to the same level or covering the kinds of areas that the whole organization or the whole group needs rather than their own individual preferences perhaps? No, there are some things everyone, uh, every team gets. So the, the, you get a training on, on how to decide, for example, how to communicate, how to decide, how to deal with conflicts. Uh, every team has the same program. But every team has 3% of their time they can, they can spend on education and they can decide themselves who is, um, uh, who is doing it. So they, make, they have a few discussions a year in how to divide it between the team members. And there are always some of the team members who want to do more and some of who want to do less. And that's okay. So that's, uh, but we, what we all the time do is this, but we try to stimulate all kind of uh, education, which is very natural. So between experts and um, begin starting nurses. And that does, doesn't take so much time and so much money. We could have one more question, and it's going to be in the middle. Oh, that went up quickly. Go on, then this gentleman at the back. Thank you. It's a very interesting talk. Now, recently, I'm not sure whether you would be aware of it, but we had a major scandal in a, a hospital up in the Midlands uh, in Staffordshire. And one of the reactions to that has been a growing lack of trust in the profession of nursing. Now, how are you going to persuade the uh, leaders of the NHS and their political masters that, in fact, a better way of dealing with these huge complexities would be to trust the nurses as opposed to increase the burden of regulation? 
Yes, thank you. This, uh, I think, very interesting question. The politicians are always led by incidents. And I think uh, if we uh, organize based on incidents, we will n not get the best solutions. Um, in Holland, we had a lot of, um, a few, I think, five to ten years ago, we had some incidents in the youth care. Uh, young children who on, were found dead somewhere in a lake. And then the youth care um, responded in creating more protocols, uh, more regulations, and so on. At the moment, um, everyone is, is uh, agreed on that didn't, didn't really solve the problem. So with, with um, our Bürtzog Jung, it's for youth care, we have just small teams taking care for all these kind of problems, and they have far better outcomes than the average youth care in Holland. So I think you, you just, you know that this, this is going on. So I think um, we should, you should discuss it with the politicians that uh, responding on incidents on, on, in this way doesn't help, but you have to offer them an alternative, I think. So that's what we try to do all the time. We want to show that because we have this up till now 400,000 patients and we didn't have one formal complaint yet. So nothing really went wrong. And the average organization have 50 complaints a year. So, so what, what we want to say is that it works very preventive to work this way. Is that an, some kind of an answer? Yeah. And it goes back to that point about political courage and being able to show not necessarily just responding to incident by incident, but seeing the bigger picture. Um, thank you for your inspiring, inspiring um, talk and let, letting us think that we are not in an era of change, but a change of eras. I, I'm very inspired by that. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'd like, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, and I know there are a number of you who didn't, please don't worry. We are going downstairs to the Benjamin Franklin Room where there will be a, a drinks reception. Um, so please join us there. But finally, um, join me in thanking um, our fantastic speaker, this year's RSA Albert Award Medal winner, um, Jost Block. <laughs>